Psalms 139 verse 16, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Uh, when did the Lord saw you? When were you unformed? You know that I, I said this one hour, so if you don't get it, we'll continue. Praise God. All right. When were you unformed? When did the Lord saw you? That's how to understand scriptures. When did he saw you? When you were unformed. When were you unformed? When you were in your mother's womb, you are going through the process of forming. All right? But what did the Bible say? He said, when you are unformed, and in your book, that means that before your father and your mom came together, God knew you. Before biology said you became like um, you grew lizard and all of those stuff, right? Before that, the Lord knew you. I think that's something to celebrate about Jehovah. Uh, but I don't need you to shout, don't worry. And the Bible says, and in your book, they all were written. That means that the first author of your life is not Shakespeare. The first author of your life is God. And the Bible says, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. I don't know what chapter you are in. I don't know what chapters you are in, but whatever chapter you are in right now, it might be chapter 7, um, paragraph 2, uh, but the book has been written concerning you. I didn't say that. The Bible said that. Now let's go to Isaiah 49 verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. When did the Lord call? When did he know you? Before you are formed. Now there is a process here. Now you are formed already. The Bible says he has called you from the womb. And now listen to this. He says, from the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. So I don't know what name you are called, but I hope you understand that that name is not talking about Allen or Munirat. That name there is talking about the calling of God that has a name, titular name, as it concerns it. Some people are called evangelists. Some people are called by God um, apostles. Some people are called by God preachers. Um, some people are called by God entrepreneurs. He has called you by name. So, let's go to the third one now. Jeremiah chapter 1. I want to see an example of somebody who is called by that name. Jeremiah chapter 1 and then verse 5. Jeremiah 1 and then verse 5. Are you there? If you are not dead, say I should wait for you. I'm, I'm very kind this morning. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, the Bible says, again, look at that. Now, who is making that statement there? Very quickly before we read that. Who is making that statement there? How do you know it was God? What is it? Is this how you will pass GNS like this, God? Before I formed you, so it must be the former that was speaking. And the former said, I. So he was talking about, so he didn't say before they formed you. He said, before I formed you. That's a personal pronoun. Say, so before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's Jeremiah. But concerning you, he has also formed you. He has ordained you. And that was sanctified. It sounds very deep, right? Like that's what they say in church. It just means to set apart. Um, to devote for holy things. So the Bible says he has called you and he has devoted you. I mean, he has called you apart. As what? That's the question I want to answer today. Father, thank you. Thank you because the entrance of the word will be in light today. Father, as you have spoken to me, I want to release your word to your people. Therefore, I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. Lord, I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, let the purpose for sending your word be revealed. Let your people be better people. Let your folks be released to walk in the reality of what you have in store for them. Let there be calibrations. Let there be recalibrations. Father, in this holy invocation, convocation today, let there be an invocation of your blessings. Let your grace be seen, O God, and let your power be released, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Today, I'm speaking on true not. 
aligning with God and purpose. True not aligning with God and purpose. You can have your seat in God's presence. Now, you have got to show life that you came to church. And I want to pick it up from here. Glory to God. All right, so I want to give you some minutes to just write your title down. Um, true not aligning with God and purpose. Now, let me start by saying that our lives are not an afterthought. There is no event of your life that shocks God, including your heartbreak, including your loss, including uh, the blessings and the profiting you had. No event of your life shocked God because all your days are written in his book. Uh, look at your neighbor, help me look at him, how about to how about, and say, There is a book. Now, you have to say it like you mean it. Say like a born-again preacher. You know, there are people who are not born again and they preach the way they sound. Say like a born-again preacher and say, you know what? You are born to be great because there is a book in the heavens with your name on it. So, you know, I don't know what chapter you are on God's book, but there is a book concerning you. Every event of your life uh, is not an afterthought. Before you were conceived, God's purpose and plan for your life were already conceived. Our work is therefore basically cut out for us. Can I say that to somebody again? Our work is basically cut out for us. Why? Because we are primarily called to discover what the true not is and align our lives, our plans, and our decisions with God's plan. Can I say it another way? God already has a plan for your life. Your work is to find out what is his plan and just align your life even with God's plan. Listen, the verses we have read, certain scriptural truths are very mundane, germane, and they are seen in these verses of scriptures. And I'll just list those things to you. Write them down, please. If that's all you get in this sermon, you've gotten enough to change your destiny and get, change your life. Number one, the Lord has a plan for my life. Can you say that? Write that down. Number one, the Lord has a plan for my life. Have you written that? The Lord has a plan for my life. Number two, the Lord has a thought for my life. So the first thing is that God has a plan for your life. Monirats, please, can you write number two? The Lord has a thought for your life. That's number two. Do you get that? That's number two. The Lord has a thought for your life. Number three, the Lord has a purpose for your life. Can you see that? The Lord has a purpose for your life. Purpose is the reason for which you are made. You are not an accidental discharge. There is a reason in the mind of God for creating you. Number four, the Lord has a vision for your life. Listen to this. Uh, vision is the word Greek word orama. I'm still going to get there. It just means that you see the way God sees. Uh, God has a vision for your life. Number three, number four now, right? That's number five now. The Lord has a will for your life. I love the song that the um, music team sang. They tell you, say yes to your will. You don't say yes to a will that does not exist. Is that not so? For you to say yes to a will, then the will must exist. Number six now, the Lord has a demand for your life. Can you write that down? People don't like to hear this part, but this part is very key, very important. The Lord has a demand for your life. Look at your neighbor and help me point at that person. I mean, point your index figure and say, the Lord has a demand for your life. And then finally, the Lord has a need for your life. That's seven key things. I think that's enough sermon. I mean, we can just close the service and then go home. But next week, I'll preach on true not and aligning again and again and again. So if you want me to finish today, then I have to continue. Glory be to God. Because of what I've said, because of the things I said before, certain things are now very true. Number one, that the statement we say, what we make and say, I'm planning my life, is a statement in error. You are the Lord's love, you are the Lord love servant. It therefore means that you do not say, I'm planning my life. Somebody say, you know what, I'm living my life. Hello, it's not your life. Is the life that you have given to God. As it has been ordained of God is how you are supposed to live. 
So I don't have a plan. I'm only living out the plan of God. His Bible says that he has a book written concerning you. All you need to find out is what is written for the now concerning my life. And then I align my life to live that out. The major duty of the believer is not to plan his life. That shocks you. The major duty of the believer is not to plan his life, but to align his life with God's plan. The major duty of the believer is not to plan his life, but to align his life even with God's plan. God has a plan for every life seated before me. I don't know the region you came from in Nigeria, whether you are from a Christian background, an Ifa background, a Muslim background, it doesn't really matter. God has a plan for your life. Discover it and align your life with that plan. Now, what is true not? I say true not aligning your life with God's purpose and with God and purpose. What is true not? Let me quickly take you to geography class. Hello. I mean, that's what I did. Let me, it's been a privilege. Let me teach you a little bit of geography. All right. What you find on the screen is what is called compass. All right. If you've never known that's a compass, I mean, you skip geography. Just one, two, three, and probably even skip school. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So that's a compass. I mean, beautiful. You can find it in Blanco. You can just buy it in any of these um, places if you really want to have one. What is a compass? The compass helps in direction and in decisions, right? All right. So every compass points to what is called the true north, right? That's the two things you find there. The first one to the north. I don't know who got this compass, where they got this compass from, but that's where the road south is actually supposed to be north and the north is supposed to be south. So north is always pointing upward. A true north is that direction that points directly to the geographical north pole. This is a fixed point on the earth's globe, right? So how is it that if you pick a compass in Ola, in my village, and you pick a compass in a do state in a village where Susan comes from, and pick another one in uh, Quara state where Tosin comes from, and you pick that compass, it's always going to point uh, to the true north. Why is that so? Because there is a magnetic field on the heart, uh, uh, and the magnet in the compass will always align with the magnetic field on the heart. Glory to God. That sounds so deep. I, I mean, that's just a little bit of geography. Just understand that wherever you are on the heart uh, and you pick a compass that is working or that does not need recalibration, it will always point to the north. Why is that important? Because if you can find the north, then you can find the south. Somebody listening to me. If you can find what is the north, you can find the south because the south is always 180 degrees from the north. And if I can find the south, then I can find where is the west or the east. So I am in point A and I'm going to point B in a desert and I don't know how to get there. The first thing is to locate where I am and then get a map. And on that map, I can see where that is. Second thing I must do is to locate the true north. Because from that north, then I can plan and do a, I can do an alignment and see how my direction is going to get there. I'm going to get there. Why is that so? Because the north is always stagnant. The true north is how you plan your navigation. It's how you plan anything you want to do. How does that concern you? That's the question somebody is probably asking me. All right? True north is stagnant. True north is just the way it is. Now, for the purpose of this teaching, your true north is your calling. Because it is also stagnant. It is your inner sense. Your true north is your purpose. Your true north is your relationship with God. Four things in your true north that never changes. Number one, your purpose. Number two, your calling. What's God's call upon your life? He won't change his mind. You remember Jonah? God called him and sent him to Nineveh. Jonah decided to go to the other side. But God's calling for him never changed. He was the same. Why? Because that's the true north. True north never changes. True north is not emotional. Whether you like the north or you don't like the north, the compass will always point to the north. Whether you like the person holding the compass or not, it's always going to point to the north. So you have the first one. It's called your purpose, your inner sense. What is inner sense? I'm not talking about your inner feeling. Your sense, inner sense, is the voice of your human spirit. Job said, I think, believe in the Jesu 8 of Job. He said, there is a spirit in man and the spirit of God gives him understanding. So that when you say, I sense this is what to do. 
That's your inner sense. You can't explain it. How many people have sensed some things before? I'm, I'm still going to talk to you about how God leads her and how you can be led of the Spirit and all that. But listen, first thing is that when you have a sensing that this is what to do, you can't explain it really because you can't give reasons. It's not subject to logic. Why? Because it's just the innocence. It's the voice of your human spirit. So, we understand that. So, you've got a innocence, and then you've got also your calling, your purpose, and you've got your relationship with God. Nothing should change your relationship with God. Because what the devil really wants to do as concerns testing is to ensure that relationship with God shakes. Now, that is that. Now, your true not keeps you on a straight track and keeps you from distraction. It is the place where all that part of our life must take his reading and his essence from. It is my calling, my purpose, my sense, in a sense, uh, that must determine for me what I do with the other part of my life. Do you understand? Just like the compass of the geographer will tell him the true north, and every other thing he does is determined by what is the true north. Whether he takes this direction, whether he moves from point A to point B, taking the bridge, is determined by what is the true north. Listen to this, your calling, your, your calling, your purpose, your inner sense, your relationship with God must also determine whatever else or every other thing that you must do. All other part of your life must take its essence from it. Your true not affects five areas of your life. Five areas of your life. Your true not. And don't forget that when I say true not, you understand that my true not, sir, ma, madam, you believe that my true not is not your true not. Do you believe that? Because I can't, I, I, somebody says I can't even keep a note. Praise God. But I think I keep a note when I'm in the spirit. But I can't sing and record an album because that's not my calling. That's not my innocence. That's not what I believe God wants me to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? So your, 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 your true north is not my true north. And that's the danger of reading books and getting emotional and getting inspiration and getting motivation from books. Because those books will inspire you to want to do what the writer does. But that is not your inner sense. That is not your calling and that is not your purpose. Your calling and your purpose determines what you do with your life. Do you understand that? So when we talk about true north, I'm saying that your true north is unique, standard to you. Do you get that? Do I have to explain that again? So, I, I mean, two of us can be singing. Um, there are people who sing in Nigeria today. You hear, uh, give me examples. Do say Akon sings, right? Moses Bliss sings, right? Uh, Sinaj sings. But do you see that when you really listen to their songs, their messages are different? But the three of them seems to be like the titular thing is being evangelist, right? Being ministers. Uh, but you will see that their emphasis uh, are very different. So that you cannot compare yourself with other people. You know, we say this when it is wrong things to do. But we need to understand that those who measure themselves and compare themselves when it comes to the matter of destiny are also getting confused. You can be called to sing together. You can be called to do drama together. You can be called to preach together, but it does not mean that all of us uh, must have the same thing we do because our true not are very different. So two makeup artists, two business people, two people starting tech, tech startups, two of them, different. They might look like the same, but different. Now, I said your true not will affect certain areas of your life. Number one, your decisions. You know, there is a raging controversy today uh, in, music, uh, in music ministry, gospel music ministry. There's the raging controversy. You, people say you should not charge, you should charge. Have you heard it before? Somebody's charging, why are you charging, you should not charge, and all of that. Both those who charge and those who don't charge uh, cannot find really scriptures to back up their views, right? Um, some people will say, do not muscle the ox. I mean, so I can charge because I don't want to also the mark. So somebody here say, freely have you received? Freely you should also give. Now, it therefore means that you can't just start and start saying certain things because you believe them. Um, I was listening to Dunsion Yekon, Minister Dunsion, and he was saying something in a panel, and they asked them about charging. Uh, Nathaniel Basi was there, Dunsion Yekon, they, they not asked them. He said, you see, I do not say anybody should charge or should not charge. But the token of my ministry and the token of my call demands that I do not charge. Now, that person is there saying, my calling determines my true north. What is acceptable to me is my calling. So it is my calling that has affected my decision as it comes to charging. Just how I'm saying. 
So the, the, what God has said to you, the call of God concerning your life uh, will also mean that things that are not even morally wrong, you will have to say no to it. Decisions. Because of your calling. Because of, your, because of that decision. Number two, your directions. It determines your directions. Your true not does not only determine your daily decisions, it also determines what direction is my life going to head to. The directions. Just like that compass tells us, where am I supposed to go now? Your true not will determine that to you. You know, it tells you, your calling tells you where you will stay. It tells you what kind of church to go. It might not be popular, but you understand that that is the place where my calling is going to be fulfilled. You understand that is the place I am trained for purpose and for destiny. Church is not just how close or how far it is to your house or where your friends go to. It is the place where spirits are, are bonded, molded, and increased in order to attain destiny. It's important we understand that our decision, decision on who to marry. There are a lot of beautiful ladies in church, praise God. There are a lot of people in church who don't sleep around. They know God, they love God, they are serving the Lord. But you do not just make a decision based on the way your body feels or because the person is like that. You must make decision on who to marry based on your calling and your inner sense. Will this person help me in alignment? Will this person take me further into God's mind and God's purpose for my life? That's the reason you make that decision. Is somebody listening to me? Number three, it determines your passion. Your cravings, passion talks about um, your cravings and intense desires. Your intense desires offers us an idea concerning your life. Your intense desires. It tells me what you desire, what you are passionate about. You should be passionate about your calling, about your inner sense. A man is not, is not ready for living. When you are passionate about the things God has not called you for. When you begin, to, you, all your passion is thrown to football. Praise God. All your passion is thrown to Chelsea. Mind you, Benzema, Benz. You ask yourself, is this really what you are living for? Have you seen, somebody said, you know that guy does not talk. I said, kill me. Every guy speaks. Glory to God. If they are not speaking, it's because you have not yet spoken on things they are passionate about. There's really no one who is quiet. There's this man there in this church. He's very gentle. Bro told me, very gentle. It's because there's no drama. Praise God. If there is Christian drama, he will take all of you. He can make you a drama, a drama minister. You will act. Praise God. You know, I can't act. Let him undo you. You see, it's very quiet, just like that. He greets him. He might not find it difficult to answer you. But when he comes to hack him, then you will see him. Desire, passion will come out. Do you see what I'm saying? You can find him in place of work and he greets you. Say, Hello, how are you? See, this brother is very gentle. When he starts directing, you will see that the fire in him will come out. What am I trying to say? We all have our place. Number four, your true not determines your goals, your aims, and your objectives. What are you living for? Some of us don't have goals like some people have. Before 40, I must be the duplex. And, What's that nonsense for? Glory to God. <laughs> it's not our goal. Our goal is by 40, we should be holding crusade in all the campuses in Nigeria. Glory. To, if I say that, some of you say, oh, Kiloshe. <laughs> you are not passionate about that. That's because it's not your inner sense. It's not your calling. Somebody came and bribed my, my, my wife, for instance, buy her facial cleansers, buy all of those things. The, the, you see, the idea is that at the end of the day, you might find that the product will expire without being used. You know why? Because she's not really interested. Right? But if you give some people, they don't sleep at night with that, say, my paws must breathe. What is, what is breathing? My paws must breathe. Look at that. I want to see makeup. They are not, some people are not interested. Your inner sense. That's why you see you can have friends. But in the matter of destiny, that's why the Bible says that Abraham have I called alone. There is an aloneness in the race of life. There is a, an aloneness in ministry. There is an aloneness concerning your purpose. Even your husband will not be as passionate about your purpose as you are. Even though you are called to be an helpmate. 
You have to understand these things. Finally, it affects your consecration. You know what consecration is? The things that are permitted by the reason of your destiny. Your devotion to God. Because of my consecration, there are certain things I can't do. It doesn't mean they are bad. Somebody listening to me. I won't go to the club. I don't, I don't mean that people go to the club by going to your father. And you, you know something? My consecration cannot permit it. I stopped going to the gym because my consecration can no longer permit it. It can no longer permit it. Glory to God. Yeah. If you are doing gym in, in places like Lagos, you better place, pray for the Lord to give you the money, equipment you need so you have it in your house. These ladies are literally wearing nothing. Glory to God. And one day the Lord said, as I was doing that, the Lord said, look back. And I looked back. The Lord spoke to me in the gym. He said, look back. And I looked back. And a young lady was trying to take a selfie. And I saw that what she was wearing, my wife doesn't even wear them as underwear. Glory to God. Now this is, now this is the problem. She was snapping a picture. The Lord said, look back. And I looked back. And the Lord now told me, if, she snap, if you appear in that selfie, what do you tell people? You know, I don't know. Uh, and then the person snap, and the whole scene with me at the background. Glory be to God. <laughs> and they just released that. And somebody said, That looks like my pastor. PFA. Ah! <laughs> now, it doesn't mean there are, there, are, there are folks in this church who go to the gym. I've never told them never to go. I had three weeks left on the subscription. I didn't go back. I told my wife, I said, I'm not going again. Uh -uh. my consecration. Listen, it was not their nakedness that affected. Courtney, she knows. What's my business with that? But then I had to now think about what others will think. Your consecration. There are places you won't go because of your destiny. There are times you will not sleep because of your destiny. There are prayers you will pray because of your destiny. There are pressures the last two weeks have been one of my toughest week in my life. Even yesterday, I was supposed to pray, join them in praying from 11 to 1. I slept. By 3.30, I woke up. You know why I woke up? The demands of my life. My heart was racing. It was like, it was going to come out. But is it that it comes out or it stays in? But we have to do this thing. The reason you don't read the Bible is because you don't understand the demand upon your life. The reason you read only one chapter in a day for a week and you are comfortable is somebody say, I, I, I like to read slow. One of these young men came to me. He said, I, I mean, I can just stay. God will share revelation. I will just stay in one chapter. And I said, that's fantastic. And he said, you know, I can stay there for one week when you are not okay. You stay there one week. When would you then finish the book? When will you finish the book? If you stayed there and the Lord shares revelation to you, fine. That means you have to spend more time so that you can cover more ground. You can't say I use one hour, I just stay one verse. That means according to the demands of God upon your life, you have to use 24 hours so that you can go far. We've got to understand these things are the things God demands for our life. Your consecration demands tells you what is permissible. It's not every place your friend goes to that you can go to. It's not every clothes you can wear. It's not. When was the last time you dressed and you said, Holy Spirit, is this fine? Or even the sense, it came to you, your inner sense spoke, and you removed the clothes. Never did, never will. Because you see, our Christianity does not affect our spirit. And we just followed after a mental ascent. Repeat after me, the pastor said. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you for dying for That's all. They did not tell us that there is something called consecration. There is something called devotion to God. Every time they see you, they must see Christ in you. That's the idea. They were first called Christians because they saw that they were like Christ. These are things that are practical that's got to do with our life. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is an inner compass in every man that ensures that we are right on track with purpose. The inner compass is your inner man, is your inner sense. Job 32, 8. Bible said there's a spirit in man, and the spirit of God gives him understanding. Proverbs 20, 27. 
The Bible says the spirit of man is the candlelight of God. Searching even the inward part of the belly. Listen, dear friends, there is an innocence concerning you. Glory to God. My compass is different from yours. Uh, there is a witness in spirit. Romans chapter 8, I believe verse 16. The Bible says the spirit bears witness with your spirit. See, there is something, I'll preach a message one time, called the witness in spirit. The spirit bears witness with your spirit. There is a bearing. To witness means I assent to a truth. That's what it means. Lawyer, is that so? It mean, even if I was wrong, you say yes, that's so why I continue. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> All right, so it means to assent, to say yes. You know, it's difficult to say your pastor is wrong when he's preaching. Glory to God. All right, so, but it means to assent, to say yes. I testify, I bear a testimony that what this person is saying is so. That's what it means to be a witness. The Holy Spirit will testify that you are right. As I'm preaching, some of you, the Holy Spirit is already witnessing. Say, so you have messed up this week. You know. You have been shaking. You have been joking with the call. There's been an innocence, but you have not done what you should do with it. There is a bearing of a witness testifying of what I said. See what I wear. See what it says. What does it say? Can you read? When was the last time you did that? Or you think he didn't speak? He speaks expressly. Even now. Somebody say, I don't do what God said. You first of all have to listen before you can do. We don't even pass the first task. Not talk of the, talk, talking about the second task. Listen, dear friend, what is your calling? What do you want to accomplish in life? Not redundant, all those redundant things we do. I want to have 10 houses. I want to be a billionaire. Apologies, you have to be the billionaire, but you understand. So, <laughs> I, 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 I want to have 20 companies. The idea is that what does it do, do to humanity? If you have been following the purpose series, I've said it, that every of your life purpose must do two things. Number one, it must meet needs and it must solve problems. Those are the two essence of purpose. Whatever you call purpose must meet those two benchmarks. Somebody say, when they talk about purpose, it's just about pastor, just, just about being on the pulpit. I addressed that on Thursday. I spoke about purpose and the marketplace. Everywhere the problem is being solved, everywhere needs are being met, your purpose can be fulfilled there. Somebody believes she's ugly. She's not fine enough. Somebody wants to look better. You came. That's a problem. You had some things in your faces. Addictives. Um, you can call it makeup. And then they look better. You have solved their problem. Because if they don't look that way, they will go to the party and they will feel inferior. Somebody say, ah, you are helping them to believe that they are made in the image of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you see what I'm saying? Every time there are people meeting needs and solving problems, you can meet needs and solve problems. Now, very quickly as we close. I want to talk about the things that are unique to your knots, to your true knots. Certain things you will find in every true knot. You know, before you call a thing a compass, it must have that thing that points to those places. It must have readings. Um, therefore, you can't call your mirror a compass because it doesn't have those qualities. Right? What are the things you must have in your life, number one? And these are unique to everybody. This is not a PFA, pastor, ministry. No, 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 no. We are not talk How many of you know we are talking about five-fold ministry here? I ain't talking about the five-fold ministry here. I ain't talking about being an apostle. I'm talking about being a prophet. Some of you are. It doesn't matter. Whether I say it or not, it's there. So if it's there, it's there. You can't pray it away. You can't die. With it. It's good there. You can't change it. You can't fast it away. It's there. Glory to God. If God has called, he has called. He won't change his mind. The gift and calling of God are without repentance. Glory to God. So whether you like my face or you don't like my it doesn't really matter. If he has called, he has called. Amen. <laughs> All right, things that are unique to you, number one. What does the Lord do for you? And every one of us has it. There is a God assignment for your generation. You carry a God assignment for your generation. Can I say that to somebody again? You've got a God assignment for your generation. There is a God assignment for your generation. That's why you are important. That's why it greets you specially. 
That's why when you chat me, I reply you. Because I know that you are a burden bearer. There is a burden of God that you carry and you represent in this generation. There is a God assignment for your life. All true scriptures, we find a God walking through men and releasing men on assignments. What is your calling? What area do you sense the Lord leading you to? You are not small. You are not ordinary. God made you with a body. Located a body inside of you. You are called to solve problems. What is the voice of the, of the human spirit? What is he saying? God has a need and a demand for your life. And you must align your life to live out that purpose. Don't forget I'm speaking on true not. Aligning with God and purpose. All true scriptures we found a powerful God. Do you see that? It's not in the notes. This one was this morning. This was 4 a.m. revelation. So listen to it. <laughs> All true scriptures we found a very powerful God. But though your God is so powerful, he, never, he was never able to do anything without depending on man. Never. He was going to start a new generation. A lineage of blessed people. He couldn't come on the earth and start it. He needed Abraham. He needed Abraham. He couldn't do it alone. He couldn't do it all by himself. He was dependent on man to bat and fulfill his vision on earth. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 4. Unto you, O man, shall I call my voice to the sons even of men. Unto you, O man, will I call. Proverbs 8 verse 4. Write that down. Proverbs 8 4. Unto you, Samuel, the Lord will call. <laughs> he said, and my voice will be to the sons of delight. Can you see that? Unto you will I call. God is saying, I'm not going to call on angels. I'm not going to call on angels. I'm going to call on you. My voice is going to wake you up. My voice is going to locate you. I am going to call on you. The Lord needed Abraham. He needed Abraham in order to establish a righteous nation for himself. Do you see that in scriptures? Follow me. Don't get distracted. Another person, Nehemiah. God needed Nehemiah to rebuild the broken and falling walls of Jerusalem. That's what he needed him for. Somebody is going to stand up and rebuild the walls of Nigeria, even politically. The Lord is in the need of man. Unto you will I call. My voice will be to the sons of men. Look at Deborah. Deborah of Lapidus. God needed her to motivate an army and resist the aggression of the king of Canaan. And Caesarea, the captain of his army. What about Mary? You know, God could not have come without a virgin. Jesus could not have come without a virgin. If after six, six years of being battered, all of them were having sex in Jerusalem, Jesus would still not have a vessel to come true. Why? Because God needed a home for nine months. Apart from needing a home, he also needed a pathway to get into the earth. Because only the thief comes through another part. He has to come through the legal means. He needed it. Tabitha. God needed her to take care of the widows. And they need their jopa. God may be calling on you to take care of the widows even in Lekki. To take care of the poor. Even in Jushaga. God can be calling you to go back to Eboi and Ambra and take care of certain things. God's voice comes to the sons of men. When the Lord needed communication to get better, he called Big Gates in the tech world. People can get called to the tech world. When the Lord needed men to be taught purpose, empowerment, he called for Sire Adeni. Glory to God. You can feel in your home now. You can feel in your home now. How about you, Tosin? How about you, Desmond? How about you, Allow me? How about you, Susan? No, your name is in the note. I wrote it like that in that note. Yeah. I'm not just calling you. I, I wrote it. If we will transform our city and our nation, if we will build walls in our church and increase our influence in business, ministry, and our career, then we must see that the only way to live is the way of alignment. It's the way of alignment. There is no choice. It's the way of alignment. Some of you, you will not be comfortable in your jobs anymore. You have to resign. Some of you. Because the only way is the way of alignment. The only way 
It's the realm of alignment. You seek God's mind and then you follow that mind because there is a book written concerning you. Your job is to follow what is written in the book. It's just like when people write, they write scripts. You are called as an actor not to show that you can act but to interpret the scripts. Is that not your job? To interpret the script? No addendum, no additions. Just interpret the script. God has sent us to the earth to interpret the script concerning our lives. That's what he has called you to and for. Number two. True north. Aligning with God and purpose. Number two is that there is a vision God has given you to live for. There is a vision he has given everyone to live for. What is vision, dear friend? Vision is the ability to see. Sight or foresight. It is the mental picture of your tomorrow. God told me many years ago, he said vision is the ability to see the unseen realities of God's purpose. It is the ability to see the unseen realities of God's purpose. What God showed you, what he told you, they are unseen, but they are realities. I hope you know that everything you see is not the real thing. There are realities you don't see. And somebody say, what is he saying? What is he doing? I have not come. We have not come. You breathe in here. Have you seen it before? You are hearing me. Have you seen words before? They are real. What God has shown you is a picture of his plan for your generation. It will take you to fulfill it. The Hebrew word for the word vision is the word azar. H-A-Z-A. What does it mean? It means to look or to see. You know, you say uh, somebody divine vision has, somebody divine vision has. The Hebrew actually defines it in a very simple way. It means to look or to see. That's vision. To look or to see. And the Greek word is the word orama. H-O-R-A-M-A. What does orama mean? I love orama. What does it mean? It means the ability to see your part in God's plan for your generation. Take note. Start writing. You can't remember all these things. Can you? Do you think you are that brilliant? Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. There's a spirit in you. Glory to God. What did I call Orama? I didn't say remember. <laughs> Don't remember. It's the ability to see your part in God's plan for your generation. What is my part in God's plan for the now? God is working now. What is my part? That's my vision. No man of God, no matter how powerful they are or how big their ministry is, can by themselves fulfill all of God's plan in a generation. No man of God. Therefore, you are needed. I am needed. Every ministry is needed. Because we all must play our part in God's need for a generation. I like to explain it this way. How many of you have played the game of puzzle before? You played puzzle before? Raise your hand. Or jigsaw puzzle. I mean, probably they gave you to make an elephant, for instance. And then you discover that when you are done with your elephant, the elephant has big ears. That's somebody who has a big ministry. Glory to God. Big ears. But then you saw that your elephant doesn't have eye. You know, that's the smallest part of the elephant. But though it is small, without that eye, you have an, uh, a deformed elephant. An elephant that is not fine. Not well formed. Listen, that thing you think is not important is small. I agree, but it is critical. Your path is small, but it is critical. Without your path, God's idea will not be fully formed. So I, I just played the bears. <laughs> Glory to God. Dusio Yekon was just playing the bass. He was just playing the bass. And then a day came, he stepped on to the microphone. The time of his training, without playing that brass, he will not become who he is today. What's your part? Vision is the bridge between today and tomorrow. So it is important what you see. Can I ask you what do you see? Even at night, when you're, I know you stay in a place where there's 247 lights, but uh, your, uh, 
your um, meter, your electricity unit has run out. Uh, and so you are in the dark. Glory to God. What do you see? What you see where there is no light is the most important thing about your life. When you are sad, when you close your eyes, it means depression is closed. What do you see when others are sleeping? What keeps you awake at night? You see, where God starts with every man is touch their sight first. He touch their sight first. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11. Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah 1 13. Jeremiah, what do you see? Amos 7 8. Amos, what do you see? Amos 8 2. Amos, what do you see? Zechariah, God told him, Zechariah chapter 4 verse 2. Zechariah, what do you see? 5 2. Zechariah, he asked him again, what do you see? Can I ask you? What do you see? What can you see? In Jeremiah 1 11, he asked him, he said, what do you see? See, I see a branch of an amor tree. God responds in verse 12. He said, you have seen clearly. You've seen well. See, because I watch over my word to perform it. What do you see? This morning, the Lord said to me, he said, the starting place of God's encounter is to make you see. There is nobody ever used in this generation or in any generation. The starting place is that God, first of all, touch their sight. They see possibilities. They see what God can do. Some see a vision of the resurrected Christ. They see something. That's the starting place of encounter. Why? Because what you see determines where you go and how you live. What you see determines where you go and how you live. There are reasons some of us are not comfortable in certain settings. It's not because we don't like the good life, but we have seen a lot that we can, we can, we can no longer be who we used to be. The beginning of what transforms is the sighting of vision. And I say that to somebody again. The beginning of what transforms is the sighting of vision. What you see determine how you live. God is still seeking for men who can be a part of his plan for our generation. Number three, very quickly. What, do, what, what happens to them? When a man is in alignment with his true north, what is in every true north, apart from a vision, what is again is there, is that they are made different by the Holy Spirit. They are made different by the Holy Spirit. Until you understand your true north, you will never appreciate your uniqueness. Can I say that to you again? Until you understand your true north, you will never appreciate your uniqueness. The way you process thoughts, the way you are different, the way you are able to manage, all of it will come into space and you will understand it better when you understand your true north. My growing up in our church, I was there last, yesterday. <laughs> and I remember how I felt so useless in that church. Because I couldn't sing. I mean, it's, it's okay you are a believer now. When some of us became born again, there are only two departments you can serve in the whole of the church. No matter how big it is. Is it that you are in Austria or in the choir? There was no intercessory department. There was no creative. There was no, no social media. So we can't even be snapping any picture. Nothing. So we are just there. And I couldn't see. And if you had seen my face when I was a young man, you would never put me in the choir. Never. No, I mean, Austria. Because when they see me, they just talk about Glory to God. But when the Holy Spirit came, I was thinking I was useless. But when the Holy Spirit came, you know what happened? I began to appreciate my difference. You begin to appreciate that you are made different to make a difference. You begin to appreciate that you are made different to make a difference. In your alignment is the empowering for the work God has called you for and to. Listen to this. Your purposes and graces are different. So somebody sings, the anointing comes down. Amen. You sing, people start crying. Somebody sings, they are falling down. Amen. Somebody else sings, and they are laughing. Now that's joy there. That, that's not something to not be sad for. You sing, they are dancing. Forgetting their sorrows. But you know what? You want to sing so that they can cry. You are, why are they not crying? Sit tears. I am canal. I am canal. I'm not deep. 
It's not that you are not deep. It's that your grace is different. That person can chant, but he can't lead people in praise and dance before the Lord. Celebrate your uniqueness. Celebrate your uniqueness. In your alignment, like I said, is your empowerment. He won't do anything outside of his will. But when you walk in alignment, you begin to walk in power. You begin to walk in the anointing of the Spirit. Listen, some of you will have to drop some things. Once he's doing something, he can't drop the guitar. Nobody knew he could sing. His, his mandate did not show. When he dropped it. You see, sometimes what we love doing is the problem to where we are going. It's not only food, though. You know, we say food is the problem. Some of us sleep. I know a lady, when she talks about sleep, you think she's having sex. Sleep. People, people, the way people talk about sleep, passion. And some people, their phone. For you to really love God and for you to touch God, somebody has to take that phone away from you. And there are people in this church that when their phone gets lost, I will praise God. And I'm not joking. I will praise the Lord. You know why? It is a deterrence to the attainment. I know people when they are praying, man, no, she kapa la doti di avata. Hey, kapa papa sha. Hey, man, no, no, bra titi elia da basha. Veke, 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 polu asata. Shemene, me, she, bele, bele, bebe. Where are we? They are asking the spirit, where are we? Do you see that? They are wanting to navigate back to where the spirit is because the spirit never leaves. Consecration. Look at him and say, consecration. Dr. Jerry Fowell had a vision to train young people to Christ. That's what the Lord showed him. Showed him. Was a faithful husband, a father, and a grandfather. In 1985, he hoped to see Liberty University train 50,000 students. Today, more than 100 students are enrolled on site and off site classes, fulfilling his vision. He used to be host a program on radio called Old Time Gospel Hour. Listen, he always said, the Lord has called me to train young champions for Christ. Mary Kay Ash, you've heard of Mary Kay before. Mary Kay Ash retired in 1963 after being passed over for promotion in favor of a man that she had trained. Did you hear that? She intended to write a book to help women in business. The book soon turned into an investment plan. And in 1963, Mary Kay Ash began Mary Kay, began Mary Kay Cosmetics with $5,000 investment. Today, you know what it is. The company is still ruled by what is called the golden rule. God first, family second, and career third. Time will fail me to talk to you about Stripe Masiewa. Che Wang, who started HTC Corporation, was a believer. He said, the best book on management practice is the Bible. The vision for HTC Corporation came during a highly career, a lady. Wise Wang was working in First International Computer. As she dragged bulking every computer to the client office, she knew there must be a better way of designing a computer that could fit in the palm of your hand. In 1997, she acted on that vision, and HTC Corporation was born. I'm giving you examples, not just of pastors now, right? Because I told her, I, I think I said it on Thursday, during the midweek, that many people, when we talk about purpose, they think we just want to call them into people ministry because it's pastors that speak about it a lot. I will use examples of Mars Muru, John Maxwell, Sam Adeyemi. All of these people are pastors. So you think that's what God is calling you for. But God is still in the business of calling people. In May 2011, Forbes ranked her and her husband, Wen Chi Chen, as the richest people in Taiwan. As the richest people in Taiwan, with a combined wealth as of 2013 of $2.5 billion. Listen, if our community will be imparted, it starts with a vision. Did you see what, what she saw first? What Wang saw first? That computers were too big, they could be in the hand. 
That's how they started ATC. Listen, dear friends. Number four, he calls you to himself. Every one of us has a calling to intimacy with God. I do not care how you look like or how powerful or fireful or anointed you think you are. Without an intimacy with God, you will fulfill your destiny. The key to fulfilling destiny is intimacy with God. When God was going to start out with Isaiah, he brought him to himself. Isaiah chapter 6. He brought him to himself. God wanted us close to him. In Mark chapter 3 verse 14, the Bible says Jesus first of all called the disciples so that they may be with him and that he may send them out. So the first calling of God is that you may be with him. 314 Mark. Listen, before the compass can help you, it must first find the true knot. Before you can make sense of your life, you must first find God. As the compass finds the true knot, you also must first find God. Help me shake your neighbor and say, find God. Before you become sent of God, you must first be a friend of God. Before you become sent of God, you must first be a friend of God. It is easier to receive daily guidance and instruction from God when you are intimate with him. When couples are close, they don't talk so much. They know what the other is doing. Sometimes I can tell when I look at my wife what she's saying or what she's not saying. Intimacy. Do you sense the heartbeat of God? Or you are using material things to know whether he's pleased with you? You know, some people, when there's no money in their account as it should be, they say, oh, God is not pleased with me. They now start fasting. Money is not how you know whether God is pleased with you or not. It is carrying the wavelength of God. When you tune to his wavelength, the signal is always there, like that of a radio. It's always there. When you tune in, you can know whether he is fine with you. You know, being pleased with God, being pleased with you as a Christian, is not that you make heaven or hell. No, we are talking about alignment here. I'm preaching to people who want to go further with God. Who want to go deeper with God. Listen to this. The place of intimacy is the batting place of direction. The place of intimacy is the batting place of direction. If you want direction, if you want God to lead you, intimacy. Intimacy. I know people who when they want to marry, they now go on retreat. You want to relocate, you now start praying. If and then they now go there, and the first thing the Lord begins to say is that the Lord begins to tell them about ministry. They are thinking about relocating. They now come and say, Well, you want God to talk about certain things, doesn't talk about it. Why is that so? Because He knows you that if He tells you that now, He's not going to see you again. Oh Lord, you are gone. So God will now begin to talk about, do you know what I'm talking about? You are fasting and praying for something and the Lord begins to talk about something else. It is because of your intimacy. If your intimacy was good, as you started your car, he would tell you, that is your wife. You are not praying. I was eating Padelian Monday. God said, leave that house and move to another. Padelian. You have never seen an, a quara man or religious until there is a Kuru or Padelian in front of them. They are not spiritual. And that's when the Lord spoke. But you, you must fast for seven days. In fact, many people, their tongues change when they are on a retreat. Imana, Imana, Imana is what they do normally. Imana, 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 Imana. But when they begin to pray and fast, the Imana will now start having certain colloquials that are ancient. Imana, 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 Imana. So you will know that fasting has come. That is where you are supposed to live. God should not get your attention to speak to you. There are what we call attention getters. He shouldn't do that. He should be able to speak to you at all times and in all seasons. Intimacy. Intimacy means into me, see. You don't keep appearance. I see some people, they want to worship God. Even in church, you will now change your voice. Hallelujah. For the Lord God. Oh, many born. Normally when they speak, it's the Lord God. Now, when they are singing, for the Lord God, oh, meaning, which God? Is it the God? Is he a guide? 
You see, the God of Israel, which one? Well, the God of many In your room. Hallelujah for the Lord God of many. When you are done, you will not worship the king himself. Because there is no, in intimacy, there is no God, God. Don't just speak the way you speak normally. Because you are not keeping appearance. Stop keeping appearances with God. Intimacy. Number five. Gives you a company to work with. Can I tell you, dear friends, that there is a company that leads to destiny. And there is a company that leads to destruction. I used to preach a message called the blessing of divine association. Listen. People are blessed by association. And people are destroyed by association. God is interested in you being in good company. He wants you to have the right companion in life. I'm not talking about, don't be carnal. I'm not talking about marriage now. He wants you to have companion in life. He doesn't want you to walk alone. You know, Liverpool came with the idea that you should never walk alone. That's an idea from the scripture. Two by two, he sent them forth. They should not walk alone. Two by two, he sent them forth. He sent the solitary in families, the Bible says. All of these things got the idea from God. 68 verse 6 of Psalms. The Bible says he said the solitary tree is in family. That's how the Lord works. Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the continents of his friend. Listen, dear friends. I want us to do something today. Stand up where you are. If there's somebody in this church that you have been looking at and you want to know their name, go and meet them and introduce yourself to them. Not the people you have always known. As that. You want to, greet, want to greet them. You have five, Why are you looking at them? You have just five minutes. You've always wanted to talk to them. Am I not speaking to you people? <laughs> if there's somebody you, want, you, you always wanted to pray with, study the scripture together. Go tell them. I say, I've always wanted to pray with you. I've always wanted to study the scriptures with you. Talk to them. Smile with them. There's a company God gives to men. Don't live alone. It's boring. It's tiresome. Break the eyes. <laughs> Your voice wanted to me. <laughs> Glory be to God. Now, 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 where you are, now, is there somebody you've always wanted to pray with? Even if it was for five minutes, two minutes. Is there somebody you have always wanted to wonder, how did they study the Bible? Go and meet them and say, I would love to pray with you. Is there somebody, now, want to pray, want to pray. Go meet somebody and pray with. Hold somebody. You have never prayed with them. Hold them by the hands. I just pray in tongues two minutes. Can we do that? Never prayed with them. Never prayed with them. Pray with them. Two minutes. Let's be very serious. Two minutes. Come on, pray in, the, pray in tongues. Pray in the spirit. You've got a prayer language. Come on, pray now. Come on, pray now. As you pray, the Lord begin to discover, Lord lead you to alignment. The compass of your spirit begins to find the true north. Begins to find the true north. There is a company the Lord gives us. Don't minimize and trivialize this moment. Don't trivialize this moment. Kapa, sefe, levule, vahinama, opre, kelida, barisia. You have one more minute. Eluga veni, obare kata, lende le kuku sapa, e vinashi, vekuli, aviro, epe, kaila, tope, alido, parasa, vendile, kroposia, e de 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 froka, lempono satai. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. There is a company the Lord gives a man. Evano Siakata. There is a company that generates eats. There is a company of lights. 
Ahodi bara. Apaliataba. Bere kapaliata. There is a company that generates light. A company that generates heat. Declare in understanding. One minute. Declare divine alignments. For that person you are owning. Divine alignment. Divine alignment. Divine alignment. They work according to true north. They work according to callings. According to their purpose. According to their inner sense. In the name of Jesus. 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 Come on now. Power Siatabo. Tepole Boshitaya. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. And amen. amen. Have your seat in God's presence. There is a company that generates it. There is a company that generates light. The companions of fools, scripture says they shall be destroyed. But the companions of the wise, we can therefore infer that they would also become preserved. Listen, dear friends, I find you a company that generates light. Laban said even to Jacob, he said, I have found by experience that I am blessed because of you. If you read that in these translations you have these days, you are missing what the original translation says. He said, I have learned by definition that I am blessed because of you. He consulted his God because he discovered something changed because Jacob came into his house. He discovered something changed. His business became better. His animals started doing better. So he didn't say it was luck. He decided to find it out. When he found out, he found out that it was because Jacob came. Therefore, when Jacob wanted to leave, he didn't want him to leave. He changed his wages seven times. He, didn't, he wanted him to stay. When Jacob negotiated for the speckles, animals, he felt he was having a good deal. At least you are still in this house. Little wonder he chased after him when he left. Oh, you thought it was because of his gods. It was not because of his gods. He wanted to drag him back. Because you would do anything to keep the wealth. You would keep anything to keep the blessing. I remember again in scriptures, the ark was being taken to say Jerusalem. And somebody touched the ark. Usa touched the ark. And they were not supposed to touch it. It was not in alignment to touch the ark. Scripture says the Lord broke out against Uzzah. They called the place Perez Uzzah. Because the Lord broke out against Uzzah. And they took the ark. David ran away. He said, I won't take this killer to my house. It's not possible. You know what they did? They took it to the house of a man called Obediodo. Scripture says the ark got into the house. By the reason of a presence and a company, the Bible says he became so blessed that the whole of Jerusalem and Israel knew that the Lord had blessed him. So they went and told the king, things have changed for this man now. And there is no other reason we have found out is this ark. David repented and said, maybe the ark is not the killer. Maybe it's a blessing. And they went and took it. There is a company you get into that your business change. There is a company you get to that your life get transformed. Find yourself a God company. Iron sharpens iron. Finally, dear friends, it gives you a need to meet. It gives you a need to meet. God is looking for men who will bear his body and his needs for a generation. All over the world there are needs because we live in a dark world. But you and I must strive to be solution providers. Believers are solution providers. Whether in the food industry, whether it is in the merchandise industry, whatever industry, automobiles, tech industry, finance industry, we must be solution providers. I heard recently that the banks, uh, there's a banker uh, of, of, of the other religion that they, they don't they don't even charge interest. Can't Christians come out with that idea? Can't we innovate? Can't we be solution providers? It's time to challenge ourselves. We have what they don't have, the Holy Spirit inside of us. If you can't see it, then it, it can't make it possible. Mark chapter 5, Matthew 5 and then verse 13. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. I said it again and again on Thursday. The Bible says you are the salt of the heart. Did you really get that? It said you are the salt of the heart. Do you understand what he said? He didn't say you are the salt of the church. 
Stop coming to church looking good. You are not the salt of this church. You are the salt of the house. Everywhere you get to, salt must be felt. Jesus said, that salt loses its savour and it becomes useless. That's how useless believers are in the workplace. That's how useless we are being in the industries. They can't even see us. They can't sense us because we are not different. Listen to me. If I have salt in my house and you put more salt, it's useless. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. When you come to the church trying to feel like the salt, you do nothing to me because I'm salt also. Nobody has salt to salt. Have you seen that before? You have salt to other substance. That's where the change is batted. The word is your eyes. The word is your beans. The word is your yam. Add yourself to it. It's by engaging with the word that we change the world. It's not by leaving the world. We are called to be the salt of the earth. Jesus went further. He said, you are the light of the world. You are not the light of the church, sweetheart. That's why we brought the light so we don't need your light. You are the light of the world, not of the church. Your light must transcend the four walls of the church. I don't care whether you go to a church that doesn't even have four walls. Maybe it's six dimensional and they make their own. But you are not the light of that church. That's why you will see in Nigeria, churches have more light than anywhere else. Because we want you to get to your medulla or blagata that you are not our light. You are the light of the world. These media people told me that we should buy more light. I thought there are many lights here looking at me. But they said we need light. Because you are not our light. You are the light of the world. You see steal money. You see lie. There's no difference in your workplace. You go to work late. You have not been able to improve the process in your workplace. You have not cancelled anyone in the last one week despite the Lord bringing them to you. When you come to church, you want to sit only and cancel ladies and guys. That's not the way it is. <laughs> Sister, did you pray today? Come and keep quiet. The Lord brought you people. You did nothing about it. And Jesus said something that broke it all. He said, you are the city set upon the altar. Is that what he said? Answer me. He said you are the city set upon the hill. You are not the city set upon the altar. Stop looking for the mic to fulfill your ministry. Stop looking for them to make you lead song to fulfill your ministry. Stop looking for the strings to fulfill your ministry. You are the city set upon the hill. Not upon the altar. Dear friends, if you get that, you will go everywhere becoming little, little Jesus. Somebody say, he's sick, say, can I pray for you? Somebody say, if I pray for them, nothing happens. Why not pray and leave God to do that part? Say, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I didn't see where he said, you will save the sick. It's your prayer of faith. Come on, just pray. Come on, just cancel. Come on, just live that life for Christ. Because everyone depends on you. Salt. What are we does? Light. What are we does? Look around the church. Look at the empty chairs. Salt, light. What are you does? Let's do evangelism. You are so busy, you don't understand true not and alignment. You don't. You keep chasing the things the world chases after. That's why our life is not different. Dear friends, pray to God. You are pressing your phone. Because you don't understand true north. All your decisions and directions must come from this true north. It's the sense of calling. And then, there's also the sense of urgency. We know that the time is short. We know we've got to do this. We know... Is the reason we fast and pray through north. It's time to align your life with purpose and destiny. I don't know how far you have gone from his wheel. I have this story to give you as I close today. I remember the story I found, I found, I read about a woman who was in her teenage, teenage years and she got very angry 
with her father and her, and her mother because they always corrected her knock on her door and said, you did something wrong. You've got to apologize. I said, I want to live my life. I just want to live my life. I'm tired. One day, she packed her things and ran out of the house. And she became a pimp. Guys were sleeping with her. She had so much money. And then there was an ad saying in the newspaper. And she was in another country, she was in another city. And she found the paper and she saw a picture. And they said, wanted. No, they said, searching, lost and searching. A father ran and had saying, Where is my daughter? She read it and she started smiling. She looked at the lady in the picture and looked at herself in the mirror. She knew they were two different people. She had changed. Tattoos all around. She couldn't count how many guys she had slept with. Her life was gone. Totally gone. And she was having the good life. She had managers. People who buy her cars, buy her stops. And one day, she became sick. And as she fell sick, because she was hooked to drugs, she became very sick. And everybody left her. And she was all alone. Then she remembered her father. And then she remembered her mother. She wrote a letter home and said, if you still love me, and if you still care, I'm following a train. Please, Dad, be at the train station. This was after more than 10 years. Be at the train station. And if I don't find you there, she told herself she was going to follow the train to Canada. She got to the train station. She didn't find her dad. She found a big ad on the digital box that says, Welcome home, my love. And all of her family were there. When she saw her dad, she wanted to cry. And her dad said, Don't worry, don't cry, don't apologize. There is a party waiting for you at home. Let's go home. The father still calls, like that man. He's still saying, come on. The father is still waiting and longing, asking that you are aligned to destiny and align with purpose. The voice of God says, no matter how far you've gone from the innocence, from purpose, from my calling and from my relationship with you, God is still saying, come on. Come on. Bow down your head, bow down your heart. Wherever you are today, like I said, this is a service of calibration and recalibration. This is true north, aligning with God and purpose. Just begin to speak to God. I don't know how far gone you've gone. There's such a sweet anointing of the Spirit right now. When the Lord gave me this sermon, I was, I was in front of a table. I know where I was, exactly where I was. Gave me this sermon and many more. But I remember this. I know where I was. My face bowed down to him. And he said, Fisayo, just align. Stop looking for things. Stop looking for numbers. Stop looking for increase. Just, just point my people to me point my people to me is what God want me to call you to today there is an urgency untold millions are still untold the burden of God for your generation still lingers on I know you enjoy your presentness but your presentness can become an ambition to the tomorrow God wants you to go to God is calling you he has an heart in the heavens with your name on it. He's saying, come on. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. All in all, sinner, come on. Sinners are not those who commit sin. They are those who miss the mark. That's what our word sin means. It means to miss the mark. Come on, come on, ye that are weary, come on. 
earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. It's calling. See now, come on. I'll put my name on it. And you can just put your name on it. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling Fisayo, come on. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. You can cry if you want to cry. Calling, oh. Patience, come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. I know some of us are very weary. Ye that are weary, come on. You are tired. You are weary. You are body. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling. Oh, Fisayo, come on. Come on. Come on. Come put your name. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Here is the true north. Calling, no fear, you come on. You sense purpose, you sense a call. You know it. There is an inner sense. God is the true north. He is not moving anywhere. We have moved so far from Him. Your calling is not going anywhere. You may have moved so far from it. Your inner sense is not going anywhere. My stubbornness. Somebody here, you just say, that's not just my way. It's not just my way. God is saying, is it your way? And your heart come. Or my way and my heart come. He's saying, is it your way and your heart come? Or my way and my heart come. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary. Come on. Patiently, earnestly, Jesus is calling. Calling. Oh, sinner, come. He can see your tears. Come on. Come on. Is there somebody recalibrating? Like a car out of alignment. So is a life out of alignment. Is a danger to the world. Danger to himself. Danger to everyone on the road. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Ye that are weary, come on. 3.30 woke me up this morning. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. There is a demand of God upon your life. There is a need of heaven concerning your life. I said that to you. There is a purpose of God concerning your life. There is a vision of God concerning your life. There is a thought of God concerning your life. Come on. Come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is coming. All in of Messiah, come on. Come on. Come on. He that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is demanding. Call it delights, come on. Come on. Come on. He that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling Emmanuel, come on. Come on, come on. Ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly. He's never going to give up. Earnestly. He's never let, going to let you go. Earnestly. And he's so patient. Patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling who me? Come on. Come on. Come on, there is a calling, there is a calling, there is a purpose, there is an innocence. The Lord is calibrating some spirit, calibrating your spirit again. That's why I don't want to end this now. 
is calibrating your spirit again. Come on. Come on. Nancy, ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently. Jesus is calling. Calling someone. Come on. Come on. Come on. He that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling you to come on. Come on. Come on. He that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling. Calling Desmond, come on. Come on, come on. Ye that are weary, Tommy, come on, Tommy, come on, come on. Ha, ye that are weary, come on. Earnestly, patiently, hear me, okay, Jesus is calling. Oh, calling. To faint, come on, come on. Come on, earnestly, patiently, Susan, Jesus is calling, calling, morning rats, come on, I come on, come on, ye that are weary, come on, to sing, earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling, you can't carry the load, come on. Come on, ye that are weary, come on, no bone, earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling, calling now, sing, come on, come on, come on, ye that are weary, come on, earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come on, come on, come on. Ye that are weary, come on, earnestly, patiently, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come on. Hold the person by your hands. Bible say two by two, he send them forth. Just find yourself a neighbor. And hold that person by the hand. I say, I'll go. I'll go. Anywhere you lead, Lord, I go. If you need somebody, Lord, I go. If nobody else wants to go. Lord, anywhere you lead, I'll go. Anywhere you lead, I go. Many people are seen like Isaiah today. In Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. There is a calling upon your life. He's never letting you go. He's still demanding because the souls are still hooked to yours. That joy is still hooked to yours. Their purpose is still hooked to yours. Their destiny is still hooked to yours. I'll go. I want you to say, Lord, I'll go. Lord, I'll go. Lord, I'll follow you. I may not know where the path leads. I know it leads to you. I'll go. I'll go. Somebody, you are feeling like it's shaking. The vibration. That's God. It's touching is touching you like a vibration is touching you very gentle touch someone is feeling like a gentle touch like somebody is blowing a breeze on you it's god it's god it's the reality of his presence it's the reality of his presence someone it seems like they have just opened the horses of empathy you just you are just crying You're just crying they're breaking your heart breaking you true and true <laughs> he will take nothing but you. 
He said, let, he said tell them, I don't, I, I'm not interested in your cash. I'm not interested in your materials. I want them. I want them. I want them. There is a way that seems right to a man. The end thereof is destruction. But there is the true north. Is the way that leads to God. Is the way that leads to Jesus. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Everywhere, every day, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. I'll stop making the secondary the primary. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Two by two, he sent them forth, Father. As you have given me your word, I've sent, I've given it to your people. I ask, oh God, that the power to do, the ability not to fail you in their generation, let it be released unto them. The spirit that empowers, let it quicken. The spirit that energizes, let it be released. Father, take away everybody. Break every yoke. I just hear the voice of God saying, The yoke is not because of me, the yoke is because of them. I asked him how. He said, I said in my word, Take my yoke upon me. Take my yoke upon you. Say, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, But they are refused. They just want to carry themselves just want to carry themselves they want to go by themselves they want to go by themselves they want to go by themselves say it's not me seeking first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you say but they have refused they seek the third things and they have left me They've left me alone. They've left me by myself. Jesus, let your mercy speak. Jesus, lead them to the path of everlasting. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Such, such a sweet presence, you can even swim in. Glory. Such a sweet wave of the Spirit, you can even die in it. You can dive in it. Glory to God. Such a sweet fragrance. It's convicting, it's consecrating, it's cutting true. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening. This has been The Living Word. If you have been blessed by this teaching or for counseling or any other inquiry, kindly send us an email to pfa at the ransomedhouse.com or fisayoadenii at yahoo.com or please call 0912-772-3824. The Ransomed House, empowering people to live for Jesus.